We've always known he was a wild one, as wild as they come. Since the 70s, Jimmy Barnes has been singing his heart out, hit after hit, that in some ways told the story of our lives. But only recently has he found the will and the courage to confront his own life, his own demons. All those drugs, all the booze, and the darkest night of all when he finally snapped and decided he couldn't take it anymore. Here's Rani Sadler. You right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you can imagine that going for about another 20 minutes at midnight out in the river, then you'll know what my poor neighbours are going to have to put up with. <laughs> Property's going to be going cheap around here. <laughs> Never mind the neighbours. Raising hell is what Jimmy Barnes has been doing for 50 years. Five decades of full tilt, pedal to the metal, rock and rock excess. A wild lifestyle that very nearly claimed his life. The worse I got, the more people like me. Jimmy Barnes. Jimmy, Jimmy Barnes. The, the more I drank, the more I partied, the more outrageous I was, the more people liked me. It was a bit, a bit of a dangerous job to be in when you had as many problems as I had to. I've got a lot of demons. I used to make jokes with people. I am homicidal, I'm not suicidal, you know? I can look back now and you see everything I was doing from the time I was a kid right through to recently. I was, I was, you know, on the verge of suicide. But now, at 61, Jimmy Barnes has finally come to terms on, with the self-loathing and shame that have dogged him all his life. Come on, let's go. The benders and binges are over. The wild man of rock is now a contented granddad who regularly does the school run. We've got 13 grandkids and a great grandchild. What's the doggy saying? Woof, woof. I've got my woof. beautiful wife loves me. What have I got not to be happy about, really? He's an amazing granddad. <laughs> He's obsessed with the babies, in fact. Like, he just wants to have them around all the time. Like, both him and mum, you know, they're, they're crazy about them. Jimmy has always been crazy about kids. His brood grew up singing and touring with him. And now, there are three generations of the family on stage. He just loves it. I love when he turns around and you can see us all back there and mum's up there too. And, um, you know, it's really fun and really comfortable. And Jimmy's family has backed him no matter what. What would your dad be without your mum? Probably dead, yeah. Because, um, you know, my mum really saved his life. She, um, she brought that kind of family values that he didn't have growing up. What Jimmy had growing up was very little. Born into poverty and violence on the kitchen floor of a crumbling tenement in Glasgow. The fourth of six children to James and Dorothy Swan. The house was falling apart, my parents were falling apart, the furniture was falling apart, and there was no food. The family tried to escape their troubles by emigrating to Australia, settling in the industrial suburb of Elizabeth in Adelaide's north. But their problems travelled with them. My dad was one of these blokes who had a fantastic work ethic, right? My, no matter what he drank, no matter what he did the night before, he'd get up and go to work. Unfortunately for us, though, whenever he got paid, he never came back. My mum was as bad as him, you know. They bloody belt the shit out of each other, you know. They, I remember one time he came up, she came up behind him with a stiletto heel, hit him about eight times. There was blood squirting everywhere. And he just got up and knocked her out cold, left her on the floor. This was the sort of shit that was happening in our house every day. In this chaotic household, the kids were neglected. Jimmy was left exposed to horrific abuse. You say someone was messing with the kids mm. and and as a result of that, you've been subconsciously trying to kill yourself all your life. Yeah. And that period of your life seems to be the key that, to the whole mess. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, there was you know, people in our house that shouldn't have been around children, you know. We were, we were, you know, being abused and, you know, on all sorts of stuff in our house. 
And I remember I went and stayed with a, a family down the road with my mate who was a friend at, from school. And then his brother tried to you know, abuse us, you know, tried, tried, tried to shag me, basically. And I was, I was you know, seven years old and he's, he'd just got out of jail. And he came home, and uh, and and he end, I remember uh, fighting him off, and and uh, and climbing out the window in the middle of the night. And, it, and as I look back, he was he was you know he was, you know shagging his own brother. <laughs> it was just it was horrendous, horrendous sort of horrible place to be. We share some history, this town and I. Jimmy had never revealed the true extent of trauma he'd suffered even to those closest to him, until he sat down to write his autobiographies. When I read his first book, I, I thought, oh, gosh, I feel like, you know, I let him down a little bit. I just didn't even know, you know, that he was struggling so much. I can't bear the thought of this little the, the person that is the love of my life. You know, feeling like that. You say um, that you don't blame your parents for everything that they did to you. Well, I go through I, I, this. I, I go through times when when I say that, but then then I go really. How, you know, how could you let us be hungry? How could you? How could my father drink all the money when when, when we are, you know, starving and we're, we're at home? How could they, those two be so caught up in their own bullshit that we're being abused at home? For Jimmy, his escape has always been music. At seven, he heard a voice that would define his life. This woman starts singing and it was like, this voice was like nothing, something I'd never heard. And I, even as a kid, I sat and I was like glued. I sat up in the, up in the chair and I was watching. And, uh, and it was so powerful and so emotional. It was Mahalia Jackson. And I remember, as, as a seven-year-old, this is true, I sat there and I thought to myself, when I grow up, when I get big, if I have a baby girl, I'm going to call her Mahalia. And today, as he tells the story on stage, Jimmy sings one of Mahalia Jackson's songs along with his eldest daughter, Mahalia. It's pretty funny what kind of seven-year-old sits in makes a note in their, their head about the, this name that <laughs> that's what they're going to call their child when they're born, you know? <laughs> that's my baby. By his mid-teens, Jimmy Barnes had dropped out of school. He was angry, rebellious, and the future looked bleak. By that point, at 16 years old, I was, you know, taking LSD five times a week. I was, you know, drinking like a fish. I was in gangs uh, and really, I mean, really violent, really, really violent. And I just didn't want to be around it. I, you know, I just thought I've got to get, if I don't get out of here, I'm going to die. Uh, OK, Jim, this is the one. Take Charlie. Then Jimmy was asked to audition for a newly formed rock band that would become Cold Chisel. I wasn't very confident, you know, and I didn't take rejection well. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to say bad things about me because then I'd, I'd get angry and I'd smash them. <laughs> but Jimmy didn't have to belt anybody. They loved him and he joined the band. And from the minute we played it, I knew that, that I could get away. I didn't care where they took me as long as it was away. <laughs> I just wanted out. Coming up... I haven't seen it since I did. Wow. What really happened at the Olympics? And the darkest night of his life. I look back on that now and it just, you know, that just really hurts. You must have been horrified when he first told you about that. Well, he didn't even tell me. Right. Nah! <laughs> <laughs> that 
All right, fellas, here we go. I'm, I'm ready with yep. you. Camera's at the ready, vocals at the ready. I'm all ready. We're ready. running. I'm here. It's all right, my friends. Let's go. Working hard to make a living. Bring shelter from the rain. A father, son left to carry on. Blue venom in his veins. Oh, 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 he's a working class man. My audience, you know, they, they work hard, they play hard. They're the sort of people who, who work all week in a factory and come out on a Saturday night and just want to cut loose. And I don't want to see this child no more. Jimmy Barnes' career began at 16 when he left the working class suburb of Elizabeth with cold chisel and began slogging it out across the pubs of Australia. Nobody would sign cold chisel, I don't know why, because we were a great band, but uh, for years we couldn't get signed. I think it's because we were too wild. You know, we were a pretty wild band, and, and I was drinking a hell of a lot, and it was, you know, attack, smashing up pubs, and, you know, it was pretty, pretty full on. But Chisel struck a chord with everyday Australians. When I think of Cold Chisel, I think of a band that did things their own way. They're, they're never compromised. To the black market, yeah. That's why people still, you know, 40 years later, still like the band, because they're, they're the real deal. All it is is about the music. When you first sang K-San, mm -hmm. um, did you ever in a million years imagine it would become like an Australian anthem? It's one of those songs that's, when we recorded it for the first album, it's, it's sort of like, it's, it's soft and it's like a country song. But it's a tough, brutal song when we play it live. I've sang that song every night for 30 odd years. And it's as poignant now as it was when, when I first sang it. Uh, it means as much to people, and it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a very well-crafted set of lyrics. It wasn't just the lyrics that resonated with the crowds, it was the way Jimmy delivered them, full of emotion and power. His trademark holler is unmistakable. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, that's a little one. You should hear me when I warm up. So I start off going, hey! And then slowly I'll... Hey! For 10 years, Cold Chisel performed and lived life at fever pitch. Jimmy recounts the madness in his new book, Working Class Man. I didn't realise it. I brought this back from Japan, this headband, and 10 years later, a Japanese guy told me it was on Upside Down. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonder he can remember much of those crazy days at all. There's a cracker here. In the 70s, I used to I used to sort of stage dive before it became popular. So I'd just be singing and then I'd drop the mic and run and dive and take out as many of them as I could. And uh, <laughs> so I, I dived at them and they got wise to me. And they parted like the Red Sea. No. And I went, <laughs> it's a head first into the, into the concrete. Out there in the audience at one of Jimmy's crazy gigs in 1979 was the young, middle-class daughter of an Australian diplomat. I was sort of, oh, dear, you know, I, I thought he might have a stroke or something. Literally, I just thought, oh, my gosh, this person's going to um, die, pass out or something. <laughs> it's so loud. I just thought she was adorable, and she, you know, I thought, you know, love of my life. But then after a while, she said she had to leave. She told me she had to escape me because I was doing speed and drinking so much, and she, she thought she'd die if she stuck around with me. Jane eventually returned. The couple married and had four children. The rock star life would be better when his family was around. When I'm on the road, if I'm just there by myself, I get bored, you know, stupid, and get out and get drunk and stuff like that, you know, whereas... Uh, I've got, you know, the kids coming in, in at seven in the morning. I sort of, I tend to go home quicker. <laughs> at least get in bed by six, you know? <laughs> in 1983, Cold Chisel broke up. Out on his own, Jimmy had six consecutive number one albums, 13 in all. There were plenty of good times, but there were bad times too. Jimmy was dealing with an ever-growing addiction. Please welcome to the closing ceremony, Jimmy Barnes. 
By the time he took the stage at the Sydney Olympics in 2000, he was out of control. I haven't seen it since I did. Wow. See, I thought they were crazy giving me a microphone. I was just so out of it and so wild and so drunk. And I think I probably snorted about bloody three grams of coke before I went on. I was a maniac. And I hate to say it because it seems like I didn't respect the, 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 the Olympics, but I did. And I, was, I just couldn't think of any way to get through it, you know, by, by myself. Seeing somebody falling apart around you, whether you understand it or not, is a very difficult thing to watch, um, especially if you love them. In 2003, Jimmy finally agreed to go to rehab. I get home, I found his children had the opportunity to express how his lifelong addiction was affecting them. What were you able to say to him? Well, just things like I, I would have brought up when you didn't turn up to sound check and I had to break into your room to make sure you're alive. I felt, you know, afraid and I felt, you know, angry or hurt. I look back on that now and it just, you know, that just really hurts because, you know, how could I, how could I put somebody through that, you know? Um, you don't have <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Jimmy was unable to stay clean. He fell deeper into addiction until he reached a near-fatal rock bottom in 2012. In a hotel room in Auckland, after a drug and alcohol fueled gig, Jimmy and Jane had a huge fight and he fell into a dark and desperate state. And I just thought, that, this, you know, this is just too hard, life's too hard. And, uh, and then I started thinking about friends who'd hung themselves and stuff like that, and, uh, and I thought, well, you know, how hard can that be, you know? You know, it can't be that hard. Jimmy had attempted to hang himself. And it could have been like that, it could have been gone, but, it, but it's not that easy to die. When he woke up, he had initially forgotten what he'd almost done. And when I seen this, this thing still tied around it, it all came back to me, so I quickly took it off and I, and I put it in the, back in the dressing gown and I didn't tell anybody uh, until much later. And then I told Jane about it and it freaked her out. You must have been horrified when he first told you about that. Well, he didn't even tell me for about a week. But, you know, I remember that day clearly because something in me just felt, you know what, I can't deal with this anymore. And it was just sort of, I didn't even know what went on. But he was really, really very strange. Finally, Jimmy sought help from a counsellor, who he's seen weekly for the past five years. It was through his encouragement that Jimmy started writing his books. I, could, I couldn't deal with any of this stuff till, till I actually looked at it and, 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 and you know, shone a lot of light on it. You know, once I started writing it down, sort of turned and started to face it. <laughs> And facing his demons has helped thousands of others to face theirs. He said, I'm 60 years old and this is the first time I felt proud of myself. I've done all these amazing things and I'm not taking that for granted. I'm very grateful for all of the successes that I've had and I've got this amazing family and I've got everything. This is the first time that I felt proud of myself. Now healthier than ever, the unstoppable Jimmy Barnes is about to hit the road again with his band of brothers, Cold Chisel. Well, if nothing else I've got to thank my parents for, it's a good constitution. You know, it's good Scottish genes, you know, those you know, years of alcoholism and stuff that have come through my genes have kept me alive, you know? The thing to do now is make sure that, you know, I use it for good and not evil. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy's new autobiography, Working Class Man, is out tomorrow. How you can win a copy and tickets to his tour when we return.